morning to those of you who are joining us here today at the Brookings Institution Falk Auditorium. Good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are viewing this event from other parts of the world. My apologies for our late start due to technical difficulties, but I promise you what we're here to do today is going to make up for any wait and delay that you may have had. I'm Suzanne Maloney. I'm Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy here at the Brookings Institution, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's very important event where my colleagues will be sharing their analyses and recommendations from phase two of Brookings Democracy in Asia project. Democratic institutions around the world are increasingly under pressure as a result of growing polarization, nationalism, and public distrust, as well as the continuing fallout of the global pandemic. Brookings Foreign Policy launched our Democracy in Asia project in 2020, bringing together experts from and on Asia to identify trends, challenges, and opportunities for democratic governance across the region. Phase two of the Democracy in Asia project continues this work of Brookings scholars and outside experts, now shifting the focus from diagnosis and assessment to policy prescription. An array of Asia experts from the US and the region contributed to our newly compiled volume of policy briefs with tailored recommendations for managing four of the most acute challenges to democratic governance in the region corruption, disinformation, inequality, and public health. If you haven't already done so, please take a copy of the volume on your way out or download it from the Brookings website. With the second Summit for Democracy announced to take place in late March 2023, it's our hope that this research and the recommendations that our experts have offered can inform the planning and the outcomes of that summit. I'm so pleased to have the working group leads and some of our American-based contributors to this compiled volume to join our discussion today. Ryan Haas, who is our Chen Fu and Cecilia Gu Chair in Taiwan Studies at Brookings, will moderate the first panel that will give an overview of some of the key challenges. And Patricia Kim, the David Rubenstein Fellow at Brookings, will moderate the second panel, which will be a deep dive in some of the respective memos and areas of expertise of our contributors. Both moderators will con conclude their panels with opportunities for questions and answers. So just a quick reminder that we're live streaming and on the record. If viewers who are not here in the audience would like to submit questions, please do so via the email address events at brookings.edu or via Twitter using the hashtag democracy in Asia. Ryan, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for, for that warm introduction and, and welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Ryan Haas, and I have the privilege of moderating this panel. Um, our goal in this panel is to identify some of the key challenges to democratic resilience in Asia, and also key lessons from Asia for addressing those challenges. And even though this conversation is taking place in Washington, it's not intended as an exercise in identifying American solutions to challenges that the Asian governments are facing. In order to get straight into the dialogue, I'm going to be ruthlessly efficient in my introduction of these panelists. They all have long distinguished titles and uh, affiliations. Um, Tom Popitsky is a professor of government at Cornell University and also a non-resident senior fellow here at Brookings. He led the corruption working group for this project. Nurianti Jali is an assistant professor in communication studies at Northern State University and was a key contributor to the disinformation working group. Andrew Yao is uh, a senior fellow and the Korea chair at the Brookings Institution and also a professor at Catholic University. He led the inequality working group for this project. And Shirley Lin is the chair for the Center for Asia Pacific Resilience and Innovation, CAPRI, and also a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. She led the public health working group for this project. In terms of format, we're going to drill down into some of the key uh, lessons and findings from each of these four working groups and then preserve some time at the end for a conversation with uh, members of the audience. But before we drill into uh, each, each of the working groups, I want to ask just a, a quick question of the four of you. How, in a few words, would you describe the state of democracy in Asia right now? Tom, let's start with you, and we'll work our way down. I would describe uh, the state of democracy in Asia right now as mixed. And I remember that I like to look up, but when I look up, I like to keep my feet on the ground. Yeah. I share the same sentiment. Uh, I mean, it depends on which country we're talking about. If we're talking about countries such as Cambodia, Myanmar, it's of course, this, uh, e either it's remained the same or declining even worse. But if you're talking about a country like, say, Malaysia, we recently had our election, so we're not too sure about what's going on in the next uh, few years. So I say it's mixed as well. Right. I guess we share uh, similar views, because on the aggregate, actually, uh, 
Asia is doing better. There was a study by Larry Diamond that looked at democracy in the aggregate from 20, or 2006 to 2019, and Asia was the only region, so this is Southeast Asia and East Asia, where uh, in dem democracy index scores had gone up. But if you drill down and look at specific countries, you mentioned Malaysia, or look at India, you know, Philippines, or Thailand, there are definitely problems. So it would be mixed, even if on the whole, it looks like democracy is doing a little bit better in Asia than in other regions. I think that because uh, of working on this project on public health, what I can say is the pandemic has, an has been an enormous challenge to democracies around the world in this fight for reducing uh, threats to health. Um, it's not very clear to me that democracy is the best uh, system to deal with health, but certainly it is the best system to deal with the trade-offs and values that all citizens would like to see preserved. And I think that living in uh, the past year in Taiwan, starting this think tank that is focused on Asia Pacific, has really given me a chance to work with experts around Asia to see that democracies go two steps forward, one step back. And I think that all the metrics tell you something different. Taiwan just had a midterm election. Malaysia just had a big election. There are many more elections to watch. And I think that the pandemic keep us on our feet. Wonderful. Well, Tom, let's, let's start with you and talk about corruption for a minute. Um, you and members of your group discussed trend lines of corruption in three of the countries that you evaluated, the Philippines, Malaysia, and South Korea. And the overall trend lines of the papers read somewhat positive, but not necessarily linear. What are some of the big takeaways about corruption in Asia right now? So I think the description of the trend lines as running positive, but not linear, is exactly right. I think one central takeaway from the, from the papers is that when we think about the relationship between democracy and corruption in Asia and probably elsewhere as well, it's not a story of just add democracy and corruption goes down. It's not a simple one-to-one -one relationship between political form and level of corruption. Um, however, I remain fairly optimistic and fairly confident that democracy is better or more appropriate or more uh, capable for addressing some of the main challenges of corruption in the region and elsewhere. So the takeaways, I think, from our essays are, are three. One is that rooting out corruption is hard because in democracies, it is very clear that politicians may politicize the anti-corruption efforts themselves. This is something that appears in each of the three essays. You can't name, I don't think, three more dissimilar countries in Asia, so great for comparativists. Uh, but in each of these countries, we see efforts by politicians who are going to be the subject of corruption investigations to politicize the agencies that are to investigate them. And this is just a, a main challenge. Um, uh, this certainly happens in non-democratic contexts as well, but it's obviously a lot harder to know about it. Second big, uh, big lesson, I think, is from the three case studies is just how multifaceted corruption problems are. Uh, I think this is true in these three countries and also generally. But you can think about corruption at the level of politicians stealing votes, buying votes, uh, using clientelistic means to secure support. You can think about unelected bureaucrats using their unelected position to direct resources in particular ways. And you can think about um, frontline service uh, providers who are the ones who are responsible for delivering public services to ordinary, uh, ordinary citizens. And they may be facing uh, challenges of corruption as well. And so to, handle, to get a handle on corruption is, is first to break it down into its parts. I think the essays do a very good job of doing that. The third thing that I want to say, and this really came out in the discussion of Malaysia in Francis Hutchinson's essay, is just how important a bottom-up civil society orientation towards anti-corruption efforts are going to be. What he, in Malaysia, so for those of you who haven't paid close attention over the past decade or so, um, the long-standing Barisan Nasional regime was eventually pushed out of office on the heels of a very, very obvious, serious, major corruption scandal. This wasn't the first, uh, but it was certainly the biggest and most consequential. And Francis argues that the, the benefits of, of the, political, the new political wins that emerged in this, in this moment were wasted because the government that followed wasn't sufficiently attentive to the concerns of ordinary citizens. And so you, to sustain this push for anti-corruption efforts, you really do need uh, the participation of civil society. This isn't something that's just a nice thing to have. This is like a first order requirement. And in Washington, we often associate corruption with elite capture, with foreign financing, 
how do you think about the distribution of, of sort of source problems between domestic sources as well as uh, foreign sources of corruption? So I don't, uh, I, I think that um, we would be missing like, the core feature of how corruption operates in practice if we didn't pay attention to global connections and foreign sources of financing. Um, the case of Malaysia that I just described was very, very plainly enmeshed in global, uh, global financial flows and partnerships between states. That said, I don't think that that's uh, uh, a feature that is changeable about how the countries in Asia interact with the world around them. And so I, I think that, that while we need to be attentive to the specifics of how these global connections uh, make corruption work, I think the, the core focus will remain domestic. Right? I think it's the actors and the institutions and the incentives that they faced within the country that are the thing that we, that, that we can... Uh, offer counsel about, and that's the source of uh, the mechanisms for change, because simply cutting off foreign sources I don't think is feasible. And in the papers, there's a suggestion that democracies have certain inherent advantages for addressing corruption. Can you help us understand that? So as I said to, to begin with, like, it's not a simple case of add democracy, corruption goes down. That's certainly not true. It's not true in any of the three countries that, we've, that, that my working group addressed. And it's not true anywhere else in the world. But I do think that, nevertheless, there are two main features of democratic political systems that are uniquely beneficial for at least addressing or at least confronting corruption. The first is it really matters if your press can talk about what is happening. So the freedom of expression as, uh, as seen through uh, traditional print and broadcast media and also new media as well is just essential. Uh, and democracies uh, in the region are struggling mightily to understand how to balance the needs of human security with the needs of free flows of information. But nevertheless, when you cut off the ability of reporters to report and citizens to complain, you lose the ability to even understand, for ordinary people, the, the nature, the depth, the challenges of corruption. So democracies do that in ways that non-democracies do not. And the second is, it is really nice to have ordinary people periodically choose whether or not they want to keep the government in office. And, uh, and that seems like, that's like the very baseline feature of democracy, is you have to have elections every once in a while. And uh, non-democratic governments often allege that that's where corruption comes from, the need to please voters. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, the ability to confront politicians uh, with the threat of sanction for, for their deeds in office uh, retrospectively or to incentivize them prospectively to behave in ways that are more aligned with the interests of ordinary people, that is a powerful tool for encouraging people to act in the way that you want. Democratic theory will tell you that that's not perfect, and I am the first one to, to tell you that that is not perfect, but it is something that only democracies can do. Thank you. Nuryanti, can we turn to you and talk for a minute about disinformation? And let's just start by setting the stage. What, what are you referring to when you're thinking about disinformation, and how does it threaten dem democratic institutions? Okay, so I want to start answering this question by giving you like proper definitions of disinformation. Disinformation is when you try to uh, share false information to somebody with intent to deceive them, all right, to, with intent to deceive the receivers. So how it works, uh, at least in, in the current climate, based on uh, these case studies uh, where my colleague and, uh, and myself wrote, is one, of course, technological advancements, right? We're talking about the affordability of having mobile devices and every Everybody can create content and upload it on the internet. So there's a lot of information out there. <laughs> so uh, everybody can share something, say something. And also on top of that, uh, there are also a lot of companies across the world that offers technology for you to share information in large numbers. So we can see here like bots, we're talking about AI, we're talking about all this new stuff <laughs> that you can use and pay and use it uh, for political gain. So that's number one. And secondly, that I really want to highlight is the same theme across all these case studies uh, that were written by all of us is uh, the fact that in Asia, we still have lack of awareness on media and information literacy skills. So which means that our people are vulnerable to information that is not 
uh, accurate, if you get what I'm saying. Like, say, for example, you have somebody from rural Malaysia, and they're exposed to content that, that are written in their local language. And they easily, like, you know, they feel that it's somebody close to them that shared this. So therefore, that, hey, you know what, it might be true because this person speaks my language. And then, therefore, you, because we do not have that critical thinking to kind of, like, evaluate that information, you trust it. So what happens to this is that, uh, you know, this is not just Malaysia. We're talking about what happens in Japan. Professor Ishihara also said that, you know, uh, content written from foreign, uh, what we call it, actors were written in Japanese, Russia, pro-Russia, what we call it, narrative shared and written in Japanese. So using language, local language, plus with the lack ability to critically evaluate that information, we're easily fooled by information that we have uh, out there. So that's number two, media literacy. And three, uh, I think it's also interesting for us to kind of like evaluate how uh, foreign investment in uh, local media agencies affect this information as well. So this is happening in Thailand. Professor Simpang uh, highlighted this uh, in her uh, article. There's increased investment, uh, uh, you know, in uh, uh, media in Thailand from Chinese investors, and that create pro-Chinese uh, propaganda in Thailand. So how does that affect uh, Thailand as uh, what we call it uh, as a country? So how, uh, your, your second question, how does this affect uh, democracy? Of course, it affects democracy negatively because, you know, democracy will not be able to flourish in poor informational environment. So if people fool you, then you will not be able, you know, if you trust something that is not accurate, you will not be able to vote right. You will not be able to make right political decisions. And therefore, you're going to elect somebody that might not be, you know, as good as uh, in terms of leadership, and then you, uh, that affect democracy, uh, democracy negatively. So that's my answer to your first question. Well, thank you. I, I have one follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, the papers do a pretty persuasive job of distinguishing between domestic sources of disinformation yes. and foreign sources of disinformation. Why is it important to separate those two out and treat each of them, respond to each of them differently? So here, a lot of time we talk about like uh, disinformation, we tend to focus on domestic uh, disinformation and you know, last uh, discussion on foreign influence to uh, disinformation. I think that is also critical for us to highlight that, you know, when, when it comes to foreign disinformation, why we need to distinguish this and try to improve how we, in, uh, how we identify them because, of course, obviously, it's going under, to undermine uh, our democracy. And this kind of open doors for foreign actors to have better, right, political grip in local politics, and this has been seen like, you know, uh, we're talking about uh, political giants, if we're, we're talking about China, we're talking about Russia, in Southeast Asia, uh, pro-Russian and pro-Chinese, uh, what we call narrative, are rampant. So why uh, is this happening? Right, so this is this going to make, like, you know, other countries, this is going to affect international relations as well. Not going to affect just you as a democracy, but also potentially neighboring countries. Uh, we're talking about, like, you know, if, say, example, if someone attacked us from outside, neighboring states is going to be affected too. So it's something that for us to kind of, like, uh, really think about. But sadly, based on our investigation, uh, at least in the Asian context, we still lack in terms of like framework on how to detect uh, foreign uh, influence, foreign disinformation, due to the fact that there are a lot of different ways for such disinformation to come in. So I think it's, for, uh, it's important for researchers, for, law, for all of us, to kind of like step up our game, <laughs> to kind of like, uh, you know, uh, focus on that, that component to disinformation. Thank you. I'm sure there will be many more questions uh, for you coming forward. But Andrew, I'd like to turn to you for a second, if we can. When we think about inequality, it's often in terms mm -hmm. of economic inequality. But the papers that your team commissioned talk about upstream sources that contribute to economic inequality. Can you help us understand what some of those are and how they impact democratic sure. governments? So our working group was chiefly interested in economic inequality, but they're indeed was recognition among our group members that other related dimensions of inequality included limited or uneven access to education and government services, 
uh, racial and ethnic inequality and unequal access to the political process could also be equally problematic. So, for instance, in Malaysia, you know, there might, what's it mean when there's economic policies favoring a particular ethnic group? Mm-hmm. Or in the Philippines, when there are political family dynasties? So, uh, a lot of these are historical in nature, but they do have this upstream effect of um, affecting inequality. Corruption was actually another one as well, too. And so, mm-hmm. we had several members of, you know, in the Philippines case or in the Korean case, saying, well, you know, corruption and inequality are really, you know, go hand in hand. So again, we see these intricacies between inequality and other factors. Another theme that really comes through in the papers is the importance of decentralization of policymaking. Can you help us understand why that's so critical to tackling inequality? Sure. So decentralization, it means giving authority and decision-making power to the lowest administrative unit. So it's really about local empowerment uh, in contrast to a nation, you know, uh, policies being made all uh, by the national government. And, and several of our papers talked about advocating or you know, pushing to have policies uh, decentralized where political and economic processes are made at the regional and local levels. And uh, just as a, a, a personal anecdote, so I lived in the Philippines during uh, COVID-19. And you know, in the Philippines, there's been a big push among academics and scholars, some policymakers to push for greater decentralization. And this became really clear during the pandemic when in the absence of immediate help or relief from, from Manila, from the capital, that the lower, uh, the, lower uh, the LGUs, uh, the barangays, they had to figure out how they could procure PPE or how they could uh, you know, figure out logistics with, uh, with aid coming in. So again, I think decentralization means giving um, uh, being able to empower people on the ground who know best how to, how to resolve certain problems of governance. Thank you. Shirley, in your opening comments, you made a reference to regime type uh, in terms of responses to public health emergencies. I want to pick up where you left off because there was an a argument in Washington that authoritarian regimes had advantages in responding to massive events like COVID because they could you know, deploy um, tight uh, social controls to, to sort of address the issue. And that, that argument always felt a bit tenuous to me. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, other democracies performed very well in terms of responding to COVID. But how are you thinking about regime type as a factor in, in public health issues? I feel like I have the uh, most daunting task here because the pandemic is still with us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and as a, um, a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, there were so many international commissions and organizations that wanted to know more about the Asia-Pacific experience. Because in 2020, of course, uh, Taiwan did a brilliant job of uh, keeping mortality very low, keeping exports uh, very healthy. Uh, And South Korea and Japan, uh, if you remember, had ups and downs. South Korea with the church cluster, uh, and then immediately was rectified and became a model uh, country in terms of how it uh, dealt with vaccination. Um, rollout and uh, Japan uh, similarly with the Olympic seems like it's 10 years ago but it just happened the last three years and these challenges were very interesting to pit democracy against sort of non-democracies but our group and this was a true uh, learning experience uh, Ryan because uh, our group decided we wanted to recruit primarily Asia Pacific based experts who are living the experience writing about it and so we have five wonderful experts with the same prompt who decided to write about totally different things. And in this process, we learned that actually democracies are resilient, but very challenged. And and so I think it's important to remember, for a non-democratic country, perhaps it's easy to say, let's just look at mortality. Are we doing well? And we just focus on it. And the feedback loop is very, very um, long. However, in democracies, where there's still um, elections during the pandemic, I think many countries needed to depend on trust. So um, Dr. Katsuma and our group wrote about trust in government in Japan with non-pharmaceutical intervention. Uh, Dr. Tsai wrote about how in Taiwan, individuals were upset that the government was using their data uh, in order to fight public health. And this is similar to the questions we have in this country, uh, in the United States, about big tech. Um, and then we have um, feminist uh, scholar uh, Rashika Krishnan, who actually wrote about how women were hurt in India by the collection of data and restricting them um, in, during times of COVID uh, in specific areas in India. And similarly, uh, in Australia, Stephen Ducker wrote about governance uh, in the state of Victoria, about how there is a lack of accountability and how it improved during this time. So I think the um, uh, um, 
the important thing about all of these lessons is that democracy is in one big D with everybody homogeneous in terms of governance. And that trust is not entirely related to the regime type. Uh, but trust in government turn out uh, to be the most important reason why countries do well in fighting um, COVID-19. I'll just stop here. And what lessons did you learn about effectiveness in developing public trust in terms of government institutions' responses to public health crises that could be applicable to other uh, governments in Asia? Uh, so uh, one of my experts is here to speak in the next panel, and Dr. Park will talk about, uh, very importantly, that the world, of course, has issues with data governance, that uh, basically Europe, the United States, China, uh, many parts of the world now have their own um, uh, legal system. And this is really very important because uh, it impedes our ability to work across border, collecting data and harnessing data for the benefit of citizens, not actually um, uh, taking away their rights. And this is to, to back up a bit. When Ryan asked us to form a public health group, we thought, what could we write about that? Everybody in the world today is a public health expert. We recognize that in the last three years. We've all turned into. <laughs> so we're not going to write anything new that other public health experts are not writing. So we said we want to talk about how do you balance the priorities of public health with other democratic values, right. such as privacy. And so we decided to ask the five writers, which we se selected from a very, very long list of experts, to, um, and they had expertise in law, um, in uh, gender studies, uh, and in public health, to write about how to harness the power of innovation in the sense of technological innovation and innovative public, pol innovative public policy to fight COVID-19 while protecting privacy. So this turned into be a, a really amazing exercise. And the long and short is, I think it is the most interdisciplinary study I have ever been involved with because I think historical sort of governance um, uh, uh, legacy turned out to be much more important. How do you build trust? You cannot build trust during an emergency like COVID-19. The trust needed to have been there. And how do you do that? And that is the lesson of a de democratic governance. You need to build institutions night and day, especially when there's no emergency. You need to invest in public health. And most importantly, you need to invest in a legal system that allows you to uh, basically pick up when there's an emergency. So in the case of Taiwan, for example, Dr. Tsai wrote about how citizens sue the government because uh, it was overreaching during COVID-19. The constitutional system, the legal system in Taiwan is quite amazing because during SARS in 2003, it already transformed to uh, allow for public health emergency. Um, yet, it, 20 years ago, how could you imagine mobile sharing? How can you imagine the internet being developed the way it is. And so that framework was not current enough to deal with the citizens' concern. Uh, and so uh, a non-answer to your question, Ryan, is <laughs> it takes much more than to deal with something in an emergency. And it's, uh, it's uh, working very hard diligently to ensure accountability, transparency, that will make democratic governance um, uh, sustainable. Well, that's very wise. I want to make sure that our audience has an opportunity to take advantage of the expertise that's assembled on, on this stage. If anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Let me introduce myself. I'm, oh, thank you. I think my voice is quite good. Hello. OK. All right. Uh, good morning to all of you. Excellent presentation. I mean, I should say that I'm very much rewarded by the new dimensions that you have taken in terms of understanding the democracy in Asia. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a former director of the Center for International Studies at Goa University, former dean, and the president of two universities in India. Uh, my area of interest is international relations, uh, by and large, Latin America and uh, South Asia with a focus on how the United States looks at these two regions, compare and contrast. Uh, sometimes they converge, sometimes they diverge. But there is some method that we had worked on that. I'd also worked on Kashmir, so there seems to be a coin that's going around like a, like a COVID virus. Everyone who's talked of India, they should talk of Kashmir. Kashmir, as far as I'm concerned, I've worked on that, is a non-issue. So I don't want to discuss on that. Okay. I'm going to take on the beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the 
point that I would like to present to you for your kind consideration, very humbly, is culture of democracy. Has South Asia or any other region, have they developed a culture of democracy? What is this culture of democracy is all about? And how do you develop that? It's not political system that we talk about. It's not a multi-party system that we talk about. You can, for example, let me take India. Surprisingly, nobody talked about India, so let me talk about India. In India, we had poverty. We had, like you said, health problems. We had all kinds of problems that you can think of. But still, right from its independence in 1947 till today, the, the, the fabric of democracy is not tarnished. It still survives. Yeah, we have a position, like in Bangladesh. You have two parties and going fighting against each other, and then parliament is closed, blah, blah, and then in Myanmar. And then you have a few other uh, examples that I can give, in Sri Lanka, for example. And all these areas that you look at, the, even Nepal, uh, and the only exception I find is Bhutan, which is ruled by the king. So we'll forget that heavenly country. It's a beautiful country to go. I've been there for two years as a Colombo plan expert. So it's, apart from this, if you look at the fabric of democracy, or the culture of democracy, that remains in India so long, uh, as good as in the United States, but the two democracies can come back. Now, the other second point that I want you to consider, I can humbly submit, what about the influence of China in Southeast Asia? You just, I mean, we talk about Asia, Pacific region, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, today, China has made inroads in Africa, has made great inroads in Latin America, which is your backyard. And of course, it is making the greatest inroads in Asia, South Asia. Let's not forget, one of the problems that Sri Lanka has today is because of the Chinese intrusion there in Maldives. In, yeah, take it. I mean, afraid we're at the tyranny of time. We only have yeah, uh, three minutes right, left, yeah. and I think you've put two very uh, important questions on yes. the table for us. Uh, what is the culture of uh, uh, democracy? Has it taken root in South Asia? And second, the influence of the role of media and the <laughs> terrorist violence aspects that take place. And the influence. These are all threats for democracy, and how they emerge is something that we have to deliberate and try to find. Them. Microanalysis is fine. We yeah. can take a country, for example, and look into the country in detail. But macroanalysis sure. is a product that we should be able to get into. Thank you very much for your contribution. So the, the two questions are uh, the culture of uh, democracy in South Asia, has it taken root, and also the influence of China in Southeast Asia. Uh, China is looming uh, in all of these issues. Um, to what degree do you weight China as a factor? Why don't we address this first, and then we'll try to take one more question. Uh, Feel free to jump in anywhere you'd like on that, Tom, and then we'll go down the line. So I'll, I'll address just briefly the question of the culture of, de of democracy. I'm no, I'm no expert in South Asia, so I'll, I'll speak generally about uh, Asia more broadly. I'm a great skeptic in, of culturalist explanations for anything. Um, I tend to believe that culturalist explanations are often sort of retrofitted to answer the question that they're posed for. Um, but one exception I will make, and I think this is important, is when I think about political culture, I, and I think about a culture of democracy, what I really believe is a culture of tolerance for disagreement. Um, and I do not believe that that is something that societies possess or lack. I don't think this is something that, um, that you know, comes from your your great books or doesn't or comes from your religious or cultural traditions but it is something that is a practice that has to be inculcated and that it and it and it can be and it can be anywhere but it is what the culture of democracy is at root about can I, can I jump in uh, Ryan on this and I'm glad that you asked this question of culture because I'm working on some papers that try to bring back in culture in the study of democracy. I know it's been maligned. Uh, it's kind of disappeared. Uh, great scholars like Tom have, have, have you know, good arguments looking at institutions. But I do think this point about uh, tolerance or forbearance, that is a culture. So when we say culture, it's not 
because of Asian culture per se. I think that's what we're moving away from. But there are certain other types of cultures that you cultivate. These are practices or norms, and I think that those are lacking. And so the paper that I'm mentioning is with uh, Adam Her, who's um, at the University of Missouri, and, and we're actually looking at Taiwan and South Korea, which are supposed to be fantastic democracies. They rate quite high, but we're saying there are problems underneath. And I, I'm not an India expert either, but I suspect that it's similar there as well, too. You think of India as the largest democracy in the world. It's been a democracy for a long time, yet there are these problems, and it's because some of these cultures of forbearance or tolerance, not so much the institutions, but the culture hasn't been really, um, really ingrained within society at large. Ryan, um, I, of course, our working group, the India paper, was one of the most exceptional papers, and I learned a lot from it. Uh, and our Center for Asia Pacific Resilience and Innovation uh, is based at UVA, the home of Thomas Jefferson and Taiwan, doing work on Asia Pacific. Culture is very important because um, that is what Thomas Jefferson also wanted to see America develop. Uh, but how do you do that in a place like Taiwan, in a place like South Korea, in a place like India, where our authors, sticking to my public health stream working group, I think that our authors pointed out that there's differences at the individual, community, and national level. And so our paper, the author really focused on the state of Kerala and how data was used and how individuals dealt with it, especially marginalized group. And this dealt with equality, misinformation, mm -hmm. and corruption. All aspects of my fellows, um, panelists here. And I, I think that it's quite important to look at it not as Asia Pacific, because that's an imaginary community. There's so many diverse, so much diversity. And public policy and governance is such a, really a grind, a day-to-day -day work that you need to show improvement, you need to correct yourself. Uh, it's not about uh, some, and I agree with Tom, it's not about some culture that is just foreign. Uh, it is about individuals willing to work with a uh, community and, and uh, the government uh, focusing on delivering the most amount of benefit. So to come to your second question, China. It's very important that in a large part of Southeast Asia, South Asia, and East Asia, the question is, do we deliver outcome or process? And I think there is something cultural about it. Many people during COVID-19 wanted to see outcome, lower death, lower infection, and more vaccination, perhaps, uh, maybe not the anti-vaxxers, and that's another cultural aspect that we, our, our group is going to write a paper on in 2023. But to really focus on the outcome is one difference, I think, between Asia Pacific at large than the West. And that's something that, of course, China's narrative is very powerful. We right. deliver outcome, Never mind the process. And that's one of the questions that we as a group need to address. I want to add on that a little bit. I'm just, suggest, I'm just going to suggest to you, uh, my uh, two colleagues wrote about influence of China uh, in the you know, uh, uh, media in Taiwan and also Thailand. So I suggest that you get like a, one of the, uh, you know, one copy and you can read through that. Yeah, and yeah, I'm a promoter <laughs> of that. Yeah, we wrote about it, but because I due to the interest of time, I couldn't, uh, uh, I can't elaborate on it too much, but I will be happy to have that conversation with you afterward. Well, thank you. You, you guys have done a brilliant job in laying out uh, the, the theory of the case on all four of these very difficult issues. We could extend this conversation for another two hours, but we want to make sure that we give uh, adequate time to the next group of, uh, of experts. And I see that there's a hand up, but please save it for, for the next panel. And uh, if not, we'll, we'll, we'll talk uh, after the event. But uh, Patty Kim is uh, a co-lead of the Democracy in Asia Project. She will moderate the second panel. Over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patty Kim, and I'm the Rubenstein Fellow here at the China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and a co-lead with Ryan Haas on this Democracy in Asia project. 
Um, it's a real uh, privilege for me to be hosting the second panel where we're going to do a deeper dive on two of the issues that we covered in this project, and those are inequality and public health. And we're very privileged to have three top experts with us and contributors to this volume uh, for this discussion. And so starting first from my left, we have Pyongwan Ben Son, who is an associate professor of the Global Affairs Program and director of the Asia Pacific and Northeast Asian Studies at George Mason University. So Pyongwan's research uh, interests lie in the intersection of uh, political behaviors and economic conditions, and he's written widely on democratization, public confidence in governments, and global economies, among uh, other topics. Meredith Weiss is a professor of political science at the University of Albany, where she also serves as the director of graduate studies and the director of the Semester in Washington program. She's an expert on social mobilization and civil society, uh, the politics of identity and development, electoral politics and parties, institutional reform, and many other issues, as well as looking at Southeast Asia as a region. And June Park, last but not least, is a political economist and the current Fung Global Fellow at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies at Princeton University. Uh, sorry? Oh, and, and also a fellow at the Asia Forum, is that correct? My apologies. Uh, she works on trade, energy, and tech conflicts, and it, she examines how government structures shape the policy formation process. So let me uh, open up first by turning to Pyongyang to, to get, uh, give us a deeper look on the South Korea case on inequality, which you did for this volume. So South Korea, Pyongyang, as you write, presents a very unique case in the, in the sense that the objective measures of inequality um, are actually relatively low, while democratic governance and political freedoms in the country are generally high. And yet, at the same time, there's this deep narrative of economic injustice in the country, and you only need to look at popular media like Squid Games or Parasite, where these are central themes, inequality and lack of access to housing and such. And so uh, it's really interesting to see this, and of course, um, not just in media, but also in politics, in elections, inequality uh, features as a heavy theme as well. And you write that fairness was a key buzzword in the most recent national elections, uh, presidential elections in South Korea. So can you just walk us through, um, for those who aren't as familiar with the South Korean case, sort of why this is the case and what challenges this poses for the functioning of the democratic system in South Korea? Sure. Uh, thanks, Patty. Uh, that's a great question. Um, let me kind of start by saying I'm kind of overwhelmed by the awesomeness of the first panel. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, to answer the question, so how the, the issue of fairness uh, took the center stage of South Korean politics, particularly electoral politics, I think it uh, all started uh, in uh, the early uh, 2010s, um, although distribution issues are always important subjects in any uh, political system, it really took the center stage around that time in South Korea. Um, what kind of preceded that time was the two series of uh, financial crisis, 19 1998 Asian financial crisis and 2008 global recession, uh, during which time South Korean labor market became very, very flexible. Um, kind of the traditional uh, lifetime guarantee employment was pretty much gone, and uh, a lot of people came to be in a, on a uh, non-full-time, uh, kind of irregular, uh, single contract-based uh, job. Um, and surprisingly, during this time, the kind of the income level of the medium voters didn't really go down very much because of the financialization, financial liberalization, uh, I have to say, and um, other opportunities that arose, which explains why the income inequality didn't increase, uh, although uh, despite the, um, the you know, flexible labor market. But uh, uncertainty did increase now because the labor market is highly, highly flexible. Um, uh, because of that, how, uh, household uh, debt uh, ballooned up pretty significantly. So with the anxiety and uncertainty, people kind of turn to social safety net, welfare policies, all those things, and those are 
uh, those became very, very important around the early 2010s. Um, definitely the issue of fairness uh, took the center stage and because everybody kind of portrayed their policies as uh, some solution uh, addressing the fairness issue. So, for example, uh, the Park Geun-hye government who took the uh, power in uh, 2012 election, uh, their kind of economic policy slogan was uh, economic democratization. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, it, it, it's kind of amazing to see how a traditional conservative pol political party kind of put forth the platform of economic uh, democratization, which uh, basically you know indicates how everybody cared about certainly started caring about um, uh, fairness. Uh, despite the, uh, that kind of campaign platform, uh, the government actually didn't live up to that kind of promise. Uh, in fact, the government basically fell due to all these corruption scandals, which basically highlighted how it was actually very unfair, uh, the society was, and uh, public anger basically led to the impeachment. Uh, Moon Jae-in government, which uh, came, uh, came up next, um, uh, the, whole, the hallmark of the economic policy is the fairness in the outcome, right? So uh, uh, the Moon Jae-in government did, did actually pursue quite a few uh, social policies uh, that were intended to uh, directly address uh, the fairness issues. Uh, the problem was the housing prices went up uh, precipitously during this time, basically overwhelmed uh, the, enti the entire uh, uh, discourse on uh, fairness. So that's how uh, th that the issue of fairness kind of took the center stage of the uh, South Korean politics starting from the early 2010s. Um, so does this kind of bode ill uh, for South Korean democracy? Not yet, I have to say, uh, because um, if, if that, that kind of, you know, uh, all the discussions, kind of the inequality crisis or a fairness crisis uh, is, was a sort of the source of uh, uh, crisis, uh, um, people should really feel, uh, uh, you know, there should be a spike in public sentiment that, yeah, okay, the society is, be is becoming increasingly uh, more uh, unfair, so we have to do something about it, right? So democracy might not be the way to uh, uh, solve this problem. Like if the, did the South Korean public actually come to that conclusion? If you look at the long-term uh, public survey data, and that's really not the case. In fact, people's sense of general social sort of uh, uh, fairness is very, very stable, no matter how many different ways you cut it. If you look at only the uh, young people's data, if you look at only female data, if you look at only uh, uh, lower-income people data, it's persistently and very surprisingly uh, stable. So uh, at least it, we're not at the cusp of democratic collapse because of the exploding uh, you know, unfairness issues. Um, nonetheless, we've seen some of the worrying symptoms in the uh, latest presidential election where the talks of uh, uh, sort of the generally negative reactions to distribution, distributive policies towards marginalized social actors, basically the words of hatred, that kind of made actually inroads to the formal politics during the latest uh, uh, presidential election. And we are seeing that kind of tendency kind of going up uh, uh, in the, the public sphere. So that's uh, actually bad news uh, down the road. So if uh, uh, in the next election, we are going this way, we are actually pretty doomed. Uh, uh, so crisis not yet, but it's not all uh, rainbow and sunshine uh, in South Korean democracy. Mm, that's very interesting. I mean, you started to get into housing prices and housing inequality, and, you've, and you use this as a case study or this particular issue in your um, paper for this volume. And I was wondering if you could just, uh, you know, kind of talk us through what, you know, housing and inequality is often flashpoints in South Korean elections and central drivers about the wealth gap uh, question in the country. And while there have been long uh, concerns about skyrocketing prices in real estate, actually, I think the reverse is happening now. There's the sharpest decline uh, in decades, I believe. Um, and so, you know, this poses an interesting question for what this means for housing inequality. Uh, of course, housing inequality isn't just unique to South Korea. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that countries across the political spectrum deal with. Um, 
uh, in the world. And so I just wonder, if, can you give us some context in the South Korean case first, including measures that the South Korean government has taken to address these issues, and then broaden us out to talk about what are the unique challenges as well as opportunities that democratic systems face when dealing with housing and inequality and other fundamental needs? Right. Uh, very interesting questions. So um, housing and housing uh, costs are very combustible issues in Korean politics. Um, uh, speculation on properties uh, have been traditionally basically the way to reach super wealth uh, in South Korea. At least that is kind of the public understanding of it because there hadn't been uh, until very recently no other way of investment, no other way of accumulating wealth in South Korea because the financial market was heavily, heavily regulated by the state, right? That's what development st developmental state uh, of South Korea has been uh, until, uh, say, 2010-ish time. Um, so everybody understands, okay, this is the only conduit to, conduit to wealth. So, you know, if I want to be rich, so let's all just jump into it. So uh, speculation has been rampant, um, and uh, there, there's a, a, a great deal of con sort of interest in the uh, housing market, in part because uh, much of the opportunities, economic and social opportunities, are all concentrated in just one city, Seoul. And... Um, and it, 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 a lot of, there's a large population, but just one city is the land of dream. So uh, it, it, it basically structures an inherent uh, shortage of housing supply, and that became politically very, very, uh, uh, you know, a salient. Uh, on top of that, even within Seoul, uh, you have uh, more desirable uh, neighborhoods, uh, uh, in part because of the kind of the education situation, uh, the kind of topic that South Koreans deeply, deeply care about. Right? So all those things really uh, uh, hit the core of the South Korean public. And um, so that became uh, a very important problem uh, in South Korean politics. And South Korean government actually uh, sort of tried a lot of different things, uh, ranging from uh, um, uh, taxation uh, uh, um, and increasing the supply of house and uh, the, the mortgage regulation, uh, a series of series of uh, uh, kind of presidential decrees and legislations. Uh, I, can't, I kind of basically lost the track of it, uh, uh, but to no avail, to no avail. Uh, you know, so increases in supply basically sort of uh, ramped up the speculative, uh, speculative pressure and taxation, uh, uh, regulation, uh, strengthening those things basically invited um, political backlash. So uh, politicians, uh, while recognizing this is politically very important issue, uh, it, in essence try to stay away from it at the same time. That kind of a dualism is gone on. So, uh, and, but then the recent uh, price hike, the up and downs in, and, and so uh, in uh, between say 2019 and uh, in the earlier part of the pandemic, the housing prices went skyrocketed, right? Uh, like a triple, uh, prices tripling over the course of a month, it wasn't uh, rare. And then it came down pretty significantly this year, earlier this year. Uh, all that, that actually is really the function of interest rates, which is basically influenced by the Federal Reserve's decisions over here. So in that sense, the changes in South Korean uh, property market is linked up uh, to the global economic situations, which actually exposes a general vulnerability of any emerging democracy because domestic, that means domestic government cannot really address uh, this important, important domestic kind of social, economic, political issue uh, by themselves and they essentially opening up, opening up to uh, external factors, right? And that's, uh, in essence, democratic accountability issue, that democratic accountability crisis. So, uh, in other words, what's the implication of this situation in South Korea to, like, emerging democracy in the world? Um, basically, Emerging democracies are generally vulnerable uh, to all these external uh, factors. I and mean, we see similar logic, similar tendency in uh, uh, the energy crisis in uh, other countries, right? With the uh, uh, war going on in Ukraine, uh, you see energy crisis going up and down, and people are getting angry, right? Uh, also, uh, accordingly, uh, emerging democracies and a lot of developing emerging democracies have very limited 
sort of a toolbox to deal with it. So that can actually lead to democratic crisis. Um, yeah. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to turn to Meredith now. So Meredith, uh, your paper points out that Malaysia, while it's made rapid economic progress in the last two decades and absolute poverty has declined, reducing inequality has been a challenge due to, in your words, the tight interweaving of political stratification, racial identity, and economic interests in Malaysia. So can you describe for us the socioeconomic landscape in Malaysia and the unique challenges around uh, inequality in the country? Off by tearing apart the concept and saying, you know, we can't look at economic inequality without talking about politics and identity and these other dimensions of inequality that help to structure that order. And yet in Malaysia, these issues are especially fraught because so much of the post-independence, and even before that, but primarily since around the 1970s, so much of the governing agenda has been structured around combating inequality. The inequality that was structured partly and substantially, though not exclusively, as a result of British colonial policies along ethnic lines, but that dovetailed with a regional inequality um, as well as really sharp and persistent economic lines. So all of those things mean that it's impossible to separate out issues of political entitlement or equality from ethnic identity from the economic implications thereof. And then we have as well these compounded um, issues of development strategies that, for instance, tend to favor particular economic corridors in a geographic sense that make what were initially, you know, a rural urban divide that you have in so many places that was simply ethnically magnified in Malaysia. Now we also find geographic dimensions that make this in many ways even more challenging to address. I will say, though, that, that you mentioned the, that there have been some real gains in Malaysia. So the incidence of absolute poverty has really been brought down dramatically. Depending on the indicators used, sometimes we can say to zero or at least to close to that. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, hit very hard. So there was a noticeable uptick in poverty, hope temporarily. Um, and there have been these other issues of inclusivity of growth. So we do find that some have benefited more than others, but that is the case anywhere. Um, that sum, importantly in Malaysia, includes not just the wealthiest who have, as in many places, seen increasing gains, but also the lower 50% of the population. So growth has been more inclusive in Malaysia than in most places. What makes this, again, complex to read, though, is the economic lines that overlap with ethnic lines. So that lower 50% of the population is also overwhelmingly Bumiputra, or Malays and other indigenous groups. That said, a number of these policies that have been structured largely in racial terms to combat inequality in economic terms have had unexpected or perhaps unanticipated, unintended, unwanted externalities. So for instance, we have things like educational access, loan facilities, housing access, government contracts that are structured substantially in ethnic terms in order to combat, again, this really important and undesirable ethnic inequality that resulted from uh, colonial era policies and, and other patterns. Um, but even though we've seen, for instance, decline in the Gini coefficient fairly consistently over the last couple of decades, um, and even though we have seen a decline in absolute poverty, some of the gains of these ethnically structured patterns of access have not been quite what we would have wanted. So in other words, Government scholarships, for instance, have rarely gone to the poorest of families. Instead, especially since the 1980s, only a minority of those who are accessing some of the best of the scholarships are actually from poor families. That's not as intended. It rather suggests that there are ways in which these policies could be refined to make them better achieve their targets of combating intra inter-ethnic inequality without exacerbating intra-ethnic inequality, and while still focusing on ways to address the population as a whole. Um, I will also note, uh, this is something that arose in the first panel as well, again, one of the issues that's arisen more in recent years has been the severity of the geographic disparities in growth and development. 
part of that has been compounded by anomalies in fiscal centralization versus decentralization. This arose also, especially in, for instance, the Philippines paper, where you have had decentralization. So Malaysia is one of the most, if not the most, fiscally centralized federal systems in the world. And there are some very odd systems that remain at the federal level rather than the state or city level, which could really help to address some persistent issues. So for instance, things like public transport are maintained from the federal level. That is, buses in Penang are run from from, uh, Kuala Lumpur, for instance. Um, Issues of flood management, which is a key um, concern for Malaysia, especially in a lot of the areas that are persistently underdeveloped, Um, those are also handled at the federal level. So some parts are state, but riverine management, for instance, is federal. Um, And then there are limited revenues available for state governments to meet the needs of their specific populations. Because land and extractable resources on that land is a state-level matter, that means that we have some perhaps suboptimal allocation of resources at the state level, selling off land, selling off timber, um, investing overly much in things like palm oil contracts because those are things states can do. Those policies may not particularly benefit the masses in the long term to the extent that might be preferred. And there are ways in which structural changes such as decentralization of fiscal policy might actually help states better target their policy remedies to address persistent aspects of inequality. Thank you. That's fascinating. So, Meredith, your memo was written before the general elections that just took place in Malaysia. And in the memo, you wrote that the Malaysian uh, national elections would provide a window of opportunity uh, to recalibrate efforts to mitigate inequality. And the November elections in Malaysia uh, resulted in a hung parliament for the first time in the country's history. Uh, Ultimately, this uh, led to the appointment of the prime minister by the king. And I understand you were just in Malaysia until last night, and and you joined us here this morning, so we're very grateful. But this is perfect for us to hear from you, sort of, can you explain the context around this unprecedented election, some of the challenges that are ahead for the new prime minister, particularly when it comes to addressing the socioeconomic inequalities that you just laid out for us and interrelated issues like race and corruption? So Malaysian politics has been dramatic enough uh, over the last decade or so that every election is the election, but this one really was. Um, So economics was really the overwhelming issue for the election, but that meant different things for different people, cost of living, social mobility, jobs, corruption, and so forth. Um, And so all of this happens in the context of what I would identify as three key things. One, corruption. So Tom mentioned the 1MDB scandal in Malaysia. That is one of many issues of corruption. It's the big one. But at the same time, this is really a problem and the population recognizes it as such. Uh, The second is the economic pinch. So again, there were already issues of social mobility. Economics is always the number one issue on surveys that people say they're voting for. Now that was even more the case, especially because of the COVID-induced, supply chain-induced, et cetera, induced recession that seems to be in train. And then the third is political instability, which is not normally an issue in Malaysia. But the, the past four years since the last Last election in 2018 has seen three different governments. Um, This has never happened before Malaysia, like the hung parliament, and also a dramatic expansion in the electorate with the enfranchisement of 18 to 21 year olds and with automatic registration of voters. So that added this element of rank uncertainty. The electorate increased from about 14.1 million to about 21.2 million, um, with a lot of those individuals having no clear partisan affiliation, especially you know, most of those who were enfranchised, about 5 million, were simply those who were now automatically registered. The fact that they hadn't registered before probably indicates not keenly interested in politics or tied to a particular party. All right, so anti-corruption was a galvanizing galvanizing force. There's been a lot of attention to the rise of the green wave of Perikatan Nasional of PAS, the Islamist Party, and Bursatu, which is uh, basically a Malay rights party. For many, this coalition did well because of a concern for political Islam, which is inseparable from also, in the Malaysian context, a concern for a less corrupt governance. And yet, a lot of it was because the Barisan Nacional and UMNO was seen as corrupt because of the fact that it's headed by somebody, Zahid Hamidi, who still faces these uh, corruption charges. Um, so there's what's called the court cluster within UMNO. So Prikatan could sell itself as the clean alternative to UMNO, um, and that itself helped to shape a lot of the electoral dynamic. 
That said, the second dimension I would raise is especially important because of this economic focus. We saw a clear shift in the discourse of inequality and approaches to inequality in the election. Most importantly, the BN, the Barisan Nacional, that's the governing coalition since independence, except until 2018, that brief moment when it wasn't, um, adopted in its manifesto essentially a race-blind approach. So there's you know things like a basic income scheme for everyone earning below about 500 US, there's a tax cut for the middle 40%. The word Bumiputra, that term for the the, uh, ethnic core, the Malays and other indigenous peoples, it does not appear in the Barisan Nacional Manifesto, which is itself really unusual. And indeed, the policy says explicitly that they are transitioning from a race-based policy to needs-based policy. Now, that said, because of that long-term structuring of the economy, of higher access to higher education, to government contracts, to loans, and so forth, in ethnic terms, this does not mean that policies would not still favor the Bumiputra, in part because they do constitute the majority of the B40, the the lower 40%. Um, And yet, this is itself an important shift. And then the third thing I'll note is this distressingly sharp rhetoric of political inequality, which suggests, again, the ways in which these, these problems are intertwined and persistent. And most important there, so we heard about uh, the rise of social media and polariza- or disinformation, polarization, and so forth uh, in the last panel. So there was a heightened rhetoric of racial tension, a recalling of the May 13th ethnic riots from 1969, which will never die, it seems, in Malaysia, um, and just real questions of whether all Chinese Malaysians are communist, for instance, whether they're anti-Islam, um, whether there can be a coalition government, and so forth. So points of likely improvement, though, that can come from this. First and foremost, we have this very odd coalition in government now that includes Anwar Ibrahim, the Pakatan Harapan, this reformist progressive coalition, and the Barisan Nacional, including Zahid Hamidi. So, so much of the campaign rhetoric on all sides was a vote for X is a vote for Zahid Hamidi, for having this person who is still facing live corruption charges as prime minister, which was a possible outcome should the BN have won. The BN did not win. They performed very poorly, and yet he is... uh, He's there, you know, right in the government. Um, it's a deputy. So, um, so that, that does suggest, though, that there might be a clear effort to address some of the levels of polarization, if only because the BN um, now is now governing in coalition with the Chinese-based DAP. So this is, for those who don't know Malaysian politics, the summary version of this is two sworn enemies along sort of ethnic framing of their demands and their claims now are governing together. That could lead to a tamping down of some of that polarizing rhetoric. Um, Secondly, there are, as I said, regional patterns to inequality. And East Malaysia, the two states of Sabah and Sarawak, are now definite kingmakers. So their share of the seats is about equal to that of the BN. Pakatan did the best, but needed those two coalitions to join. And so now we see an East Malaysian deputy prime minister, an unprecedentedly high level of representation of East Malaysians in the cabinet, and a set of promises, especially in the Pakatan Manifesto, more seriously to address those issues of inequality that have continued to plague East Malaysia in particular. Third, we will likely see better targeting of benefits, such as to ensure that those educational and other benefits reach those who need them. So things like government scholarships, housing access, uh, rural uh, loan facilities, and other, other things that can really help those who need them. Fourth, one might hope that we might see, as a result of some of the electoral dimensions, some of the the claims made and some of the complaints framed, Uh, higher investment in public institutions such as schools and universities. I will say, though, that the the direction here is a little less clear. And then lastly, because of the really strong concern for corruption that we saw, especially among voters in the last two elections now, not just the last one, we might see more of a professionalization of GLCs, government-linked corporations, and measures such as political financing legislation, which is near absent in Malaysia up until now, to reduce the temptation for inefficiencies for political purposes, for these other pathologies that really help to, to bring politics down to uh, a less than optimal level in terms of the sorts of claims made, the extent to which patronage still governs so much of the political process, and the ways in which Malaysia might be able to work in a more economically efficient manner, pull itself out of the middle income trap if some of these functions were made um, less political and able to work better.
Wonderful. So certainly a lot to keep our eye on. Um, so June, I'm going to turn to you. Um, and, you know, we talked about this a bit already in the first panel, but the pandemic obviously posed incredible challenges to all states, regardless of their political system, and democracies in particular had to rapidly develop policies uh, and technologies to both protect the health of their populations while at the same time guarding individual freedoms. Um, and, for instance, we had the use of pandemic management mobile applications and quarantine requirements, which are often in tension with data privacy concerns and freedom of movement. And South Korea is a place where uh, they really collected and deployed an extraordinary amount of data during the pandemic in the name of safeguarding public health. So can you outline for us how the South Korean government managed these efforts, um, how it balanced the, the concerns that are intentioned, what steps it took to, to address privacy concerns and data protection, and, and the general response of South Korean citizens? So I think this question is uh, sort of a um, repeated question for us to pose with regard to data pr protection, data privacy related issues across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, because each country has a different dynamic, different kind of um, jurisdictional mandate or legislations with regard to data protection. And in the South Korean case, uh, I believe in the first panel, Dr. Lin pointed out um, how this is linked to uh, democratic values. But uh, in terms of democratic values, she mentioned trust. But in the South Korean case, I think there is one um, additional element in addition to trust that had to happen before the pandemic in order for the smart management system by the South Korean government to activate, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which happened in 2015, uh, 2016, I believe, uh, because uh, compared to the Taiwanese experience of SARS, of course, in, in Korea there was also, because the border is very, very adjacent to China, uh, in Hong Kong, there was uh, a, a acute response to SARS in Korea as well, but not as much shock uh, as it had as MERS. And during MERS, uh, the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act was revised in order to accommodate data collection because, first of all, the hospitals did not want to share data about the tests. And the only place where you could actually do solid tests was KDCA at the time, uh, which is uh, basically the CDC here, and parallel to the CDC here. And uh, at the time, I think that um, hospitals, patients had a hard time trying to get solid test uh, results, or uh, they also had a hard time trying to um, enter facilities with, uh, with, uh, without caution. So um, the, these kinds of issues that sparked uh, public uh, unrest during MERS compel the laws to change. And those changed laws of the IDCPA compelled this time around during the pandemic to, you know, for the government to actually take, take some um, necessary measures toward data collection, which are now embedded in the IDCPA. So when um, in the first uh, stage of the pandemic in 2020, uh, when there were lots of um, coverages regarding South Korea being a uh, dystopian or um, something, something very, um, not very democratic in terms of data management, it, it, it started to cover uh, most of the contact tracing methods in such a way that South Korea has been um, go going the authoritarian route in some way. But it's because of the IDCPA that was revised that people had to relinquish their data in some ways without the will to actually, voluntary will to actually do so. Of course, people had the societal agreement to actually protect the public health in, in, in general. But I think the, without the law, it would have been uh, uh, unlawful. So it's one of the misunderstandings that we have in explaining the South Korean case, that South Korea went ahead and did this, did that, but uh, in actuality, it's the precedence of a previous sickness, or, or I can't call it a pandemic because the WHO never called MERS a pandemic. It's an overwide uh, spread disease that compelled this to happen. And uh, in um, your question regarding how this was done, uh, step by step, I think there was a big, big uh, uh, 
sense of、um, emergency amongst the government officials in the MOHW, and. At the time, what was already existing in place was South Korea's development towards smart cities. So the smart city-related、uh, grids, in terms of operations, in terms of data trafficking and collection, that that was already in place, and you ha- just had to insert certain other kinds of ingredients, certain other kinds of data into the system on a conditional basis, so that people, if they were Uh, if they th- found themselves sick and they they tested positive, then tracing methods could happen, not just manually but also with the help of data. This is the effective way to explain this, because when when you're crunched with so many people trying to run to these test centers and then trying to get tests uh, uh, contact tracing done by manual contact tracing, there was no way humans could address all of that. And that—that's when the smart management system came in. And one of the officials who was who was working on the smart management system suggested if you added GPS data from cell phones, credit card data from transactions, and partially very limited、uh, CCTV footages, then you could combine the tracing methods.、Uh, you could combine the traces of a person to contribute to contact tracing. So. These things had to do with the、uh, financial authorities giving consent to allowing for data to be accessed by MOHW and the smart management system. Those things are and GPS data, for one, is not something that in、uh, say democratic societies in general.、Uh, I'm speaking in terms of the GDPR、uh, jurisdictions in the EU. It's something that is not. It's a non-starter because GPS data, traces of your body, are supposed to be considered your body, <laughs> your your own、um, right to、uh, to keep and to preserve、uh, without any kind of interruption by a, a, another entity. But in this certain case, GPS data in the South Korean、uh, smart management system, it was used as a utility to track. And trace where the person has been and who has been contacted by uh, um, um, contacted uh, uh, contacted yes <laughs> contacted by、uh, a certain person and credit card data for the for the most part I think that was the most、um, controversial part of this this whole phenomenon. But it was allowed because the IDCPA allowed for it. And then later on, as I mentioned in the essay,、um, three different laws were revised in order to accommodate changes for for, for a more、uh, subtle yet、um, toward scientific research to use data toward uh, uh,、um, increasing public health. Effectiveness, and those were the laws also in the Personal Information Protection Act, and the credit law, and also、um, the、um, uh, the communications-related laws. Those three laws were revised, and in revising those laws, I think South Korea went through a moment of thinking about to what extent、uh, collection of data. Control of data and processing of data would be allowed by their citizens, and when they went through, there were a series of hackathons by experts, by professors, by normal citizens that participated in the hackathons to address their concerns, to address what they thought about data in in general in South Korea, and when those laws were passed. I think the concept of self-integration of data, which is to combine different pieces、uh, pieces of an individual's data by a third party that is authorized by the government, those questions came into being. And right now, South Korea is in between、uh, trying to protect the public good、uh, in terms of data protection, at the same time、uh, trying to use it、uh, to, toward、um, scientific research. Uh, and Cancer Act, the Cancer Act was also revised to allow for big data-related research on cancer. So these kinds of developments tell us that countries have taken on their 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 roles,、uh, their own decisions by their own jurisdictional laws to go ahead and、uh, go about their data data management. And it's not something that you could deal. With in terms of、uh, digital trade or any kind of a market access related related agree,、uh, negotiations, because now countries are so different in terms of going about their data.
So, so that's fascinating. And surely this isn't the end of the conversation in terms of data governance and privacy. I mean, th these are the questions that will stay with us for dec in the decades ahead. And you started to get at how um, there are challenges in sort of different regulations at the international and, and national and even local levels, perhaps. And so as we... Um, as we look towards sort of more and more data governance or data collection and governance in the future, what are some sort of key lessons that we can take away from the South Korean case or from your broader research on international and, and regional level um, governance on sort of how you can harmonize standards mm -hmm. um, in this era where governments are increasingly deploying data collection uh, in a way that they align with democratic norms as well? So if you could mm. quickly touch on that and then we'll try to squeeze in a question before we close oh. up the panel. So I think that um, given that we have different levels of data protection or regulatory mechanisms across jurisdictions, we have to start from there. There are societies, countries where there is no data law at all. So bridging that gap comes from um, trying to see what other uh, com countries are doing and what kinds of issues are most critical to each society. Each society, each country has to make that decision toward data protection. Which areas am, am I going to protect? So it's not something that you could just um, uh, put a blanket over and say this is data protection. Each country has to decide what kind of democratic values in terms of data privacy they want to protect. At the same time, I think that from the U.S. standpoint, there is no blanket law covering data privacy in, in America. There is a consumer-related act uh, in California which compels uh, some, some data collection, some uh, at the same time protection even. Um, these kinds of different um, approaches across the U.S., it's also uh, hindering the U.S. from being able to uh, exert some, some data-related issues in, a, in the Pacific sort of a mechanism. So I think within the U.S. there has to be something, not some, uh, uh, a strict, uh, base, strict law such as the GDPR, but at least an internal conversation about you know, if, if it's going to be state-based, state-based. If it's going to be federal, then federal. There has to be this kind of a movement within the U.S. for us to sense as partners where the U.S. is headed next on data protection. Thank you. I think we could get one question from the audience. And so while, we, while the microphone is go over, going over uh, to, yes, Mark in the back, I just wanted to leave one question for the panelists, and you can feel free to address uh, whichever one you'd like in these final minutes. And so a key takeaway from our series is the fact that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to any of these challenges, and, and um, all of the cases and the diversity of recommendations in this volume um, t speak to that. But if there's one key recommendation that you want to leave for us on the table today and where Asian democracies might learn from each other or where the United States might learn from Asia. I would love to hear that. And then Mark will hear your question. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, Mark Tokolo from KEI. I'm just trying to understand the relationship between democracy and the four challenges. So is your conclusion, having looked at it, that you need more democracy to deal with the challenges or is it sometimes you have to deviate from democratic norms to save democracy? Or is it that the system is neutral, that the question is the quality of uh, policy prescription rather than form of government? Let me start because I'm sitting right next to Patty. Um, but, uh, so I can basically address two questions at the same time. I think uh, the four areas that we're talking about here, uh, in my case, inequality, uh, really is uh, connecting sort of the uh, democratic system as a way of governance and uh, the society as uh, at where the effect of the governance is felt. And traditionally, the you know, political science literature actually kind of pointed out that it doesn't really matter that much for the survival of a, a democratic a democracy as a way of governance, uh, whether or not people are kept happy, uh, because it is really elite coordination that uh, determines the survival of the democracy. But over time, I think we, we, we're learning the, uh, the importance of uh, democratic accountability, right? Uh, people, uh, can a democratic government can deliver uh, what they promise to deliver to the people? Um, and uh, the recent sort of democratic crisis we've been seeing in the past 
four, five, six years in various regions in the world is that uh, the decline in democratic accountability poses a direct challenge uh, to the survival of democracy or, uh, uh, you know, at least kind of, uh, it is kind of the way in which the decay in democracy actually occurs. So I guess that's where it, it, it is, imp that's why it is important with, that we look at these four policy areas uh, that are actually fundamentally important for that kind of delivery of democratic accountability. Um, uh, so, uh, so what can we learn, right? Uh, so in terms of that, uh, the more, I, I, it not kind of uh, leaving aside the simple dichotomy of like, you know, active government, uh, like govern, more government spending or less government spending. I think uh, uh, in all these four challenges, but particularly in the areas of inequality, it is really uh, where uh, a government initiative uh, becomes very, very important. Right, uh, the, the, the primarily because much of the uh, things that are determining the public sentiment towards democracy uh, is not strictly under the control of the national government. Uh, so traditional ways of democratic governance cannot solve, uh, cannot address many of these issues. So government has to then be uh, more active and kind of prioritize some of the uh, issues in solving the problems. So in, in the matter of inequality, uh, what I suggest uh, uh, in the paper, which I think can be translated to other uh, national context too, is uh, for the decentralization, uh, uh, um, economic uh, and social uh, decentralization such that it, not, it doesn't, uh, all the resources are not concentrated uh, in a certain area which basically uh, kind of uh, uh, lays out all the uh, roots of the problems. Uh, and uh, fiscal expansionism, if it is available for the uh, national government and countries like um, South Korea, Taiwan, and Indonesia, Malaysia, to a certain extent, can actually afford further fiscal ex uh, expansion uh, as of now. Uh, so uh, if th that can address uh, some of the problems, and that's kind of the takeaway for uh, other countries too. Okay, so I also would, would point not necessarily to democracy as a set of institutions, but rather I think we can answer these questions together by at risk of taking sides between Tom and Andrew from the last panel, um, by suggesting that there are certain norms or attributes of a democratic culture that themselves are useful in terms of addressing these issues. So, and, and I'll say that in terms of the things that I think are the most useful things to extrapolate as takeaways. So one, in terms of understanding something like the extent of inequality or how to combat it, a key aspect is transparency, is having reliable access to reliable information. And that itself is a highlight more of democratic systems and more of, of um, authoritarian systems. You know, just one specific way in which this would help in Malaysia. The category Bumiputra, it's, you know, two-thirds of the population. Disaggregating that category, which government statistics generally do not, would help dramatically in being able to target solutions better to address those who most suffer from the system. So those would be, for instance, the Orang Asli or the Orang Asal, these indigenous peoples of Sabah and Sarawak, East Malaysia and the peninsula, who are lumped in with this much larger category, but who really need specific targeted policies. Second, migrant workers. Migrant workers, if we look at COVID, they are the worst hit of all populations, especially in a place like Southeast Asia, where you have both countries of origin that suddenly received back a lot of workers and countries of destination that we're left with either dealing with these populations in hostels, for instance, in Singapore, or having to figure out what to do in terms of their economic re recovery afterwards and so forth. Democracy does not, in any of these states, capture this population. They are disenfranchised fully. And so this is where the institutions of democracy aren't so necessarily helpful, but the norms of understanding what, what are the ways, for instance, to ensure that there's not a race to the bottom in salaries, such that the appeal of migrant workers is, you can pay them less, um, that, that that's really less of an issue. Okay, third, food security. So this was, for the first time I've seen it in Malaysia, a huge campaign issue. But it gets at an underlying concern for everyone, including in the U.S., where we see rising food prices, concerns during the pandemic of sub supply chains of access and so forth. So again, there are ways in which we can understand democratic norms of creating a national identity, creating a... a a function of self-sufficiency and so forth can be really useful in, being, in having that resilience in terms of crisis. And then lastly, higher social spending overall. So one of the benefits of an electoral system is that to some extent it means the interests, needs, desires of the mass 
are given space for articulation and hopefully for redress. And this is one area in which we certainly see the need for better so social safety nets or floors across the region, really across anywhere, um, which may not come through in a system with a fully top-down policymaking process without some space for articulation. So again, not necessarily something that democratic institutions are necessary for, but for which that culture or ability to accommodate the range of perspectives may really be quite helpful. And from my perspective, it seems that, you know, it's not just democracies, but autocracies as well that went through vaccine inequality in the past, in the past uh, three years. And at the WTO, so foreign policy-wise, we don't seem to have a clear indication as of yet on how we're going to disseminate high-quality vaccines to the rest of the world. Korea, for instance, from where, where I come from, there was, luckily, a provision of vaccines that deterred, uh, well, there were um, side effects arising from deaths or uh, people who suffered uh, illnesses from the vaccines. But w what I want to point to is, had it not been uh, for an effective vaccination drive, South Korea could not have reopened uh, or regained their activities as we do uh, now, because in some parts of the world, we, we still don't have those kinds of reactivation. And uh, foreign policy, for all it's worth, um, some of the things that we think about in terms of global public goods or global uh, health, public health in general, some of the things that we think about that are supposed to be a given <laughs> when, when we think about um, the access to these uh, goods, they were not promised, uh, they were not a given for us during the pandemic. And I think that's one of the, the reasons why it may prompt um, the, the difficulties of interaction amongst democracies or autocracies, depending on how they receive their vaccines. Okay, well, thank you. This has been such a rich and substantive discussion, and I'm just so grateful to our three speakers who are here with us today. I encourage, if you haven't yet, grab a hard copy. And for those who are tuning in online, uh, we have PDFs online that are available that you could download uh, to read up more on the cases that are here in this Democracy in Asia volume. Would you please join me in thanking all of the speakers for today?